What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. I would say welcome back to the HQ, but we're in a, a little bit of a different location. This is the fourth episode of the behind the scenes fantasy football industry. And I know I always say that, you know, we have someone very, 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 very special on the channel. You know, we've had some awesome, awesome guests that have opened up and really um, gave me a great behind the scenes look. And hopefully uh, you guys in the audience have liked it as much as I have because I'm doing this mainly for you guys, you know, to uh, hopefully help inspire a lot of you younger guys and, and show you what it takes to kind of make it in this industry. Uh, but today, this is going to be a hard one to top for me because, Brad, I I'm kind of fangirling right now a little bit. I, I don't usually get, you know, nervous with, with uh, doing these video interviews, but I want to say that uh, I, I thought you were literally the perfect person to come on to discuss this because you have been one of my, if not the single biggest inspiration in a lot of the things I am doing to this point. And uh, I mean, a apart from you being, you know, an awesome fantasy analyst and writer and stuff, you were you were one of the few people in the industry that I see that built their brand around their personality, right? And you are like unforgivably yourself, and I think that is so important in today's day and age. And you are someone who kind of instilled that in me when I was younger, and I used to like follow your stuff, and I was like, this guy, you know, your personality comes through in your writing, it comes through when you're on camera. Um, so that was something that I took away from me. And I'm like, you can be successful and you can get to the points that you want to get to being your true authentic self. And I see a lot of people trying to, you know, be the next Matt Berry and try to write like how they think they should and, and dress how they think they should. And, you know, it, it's uh, we see a lot of this going on today. So you were one of the few guys that really stuck to the stuck to that script and, and were your true self. And for that, you will always be an inspiration to me. So this is a this is a special effort for me. And I want to say uh, thank you so, so much for coming on the channel. I know my audience is going to love this hopefully as much as I do, um, but, you know, welcome to the channel. And uh, why don't you kind of give us a background about, you know, how you kind of came up and how you, uh, you know, came through the industry. Because obviously you're, you know, I, I used I used a line on James Coe and I said that, that guy's more decorated than Tom Brady at this point. But I feel like I maybe should have held that analogy for you. You know, you're a uh, fantasy sports trade association, Hall of Famer, seven time fantasy sports writer of the year, it was eight, seven, something up there. You got you got a lot of hardware behind you. Um so I'm interested to know, you know, how how did it all start? Where did it where did it all begin? Well, I appreciate the very kind words and thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's pretty rare that I inspire people to do positive things. <laughs> so uh, you're in rarefied air, my friend. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been in this business for a long time. Uh, I used to be a teacher, believe it or not, uh, in Champaign, Illinois, my hometown. I taught uh, impressionable young minds, uh, history <laughs> and also weather. Uh, so my background's a little funky. Uh, I have a uh, an education slash history degree from the University of Illinois, and I got a master's degree in geoscience with an emphasis in meteorology. So I figured, well, if you know, I could go out and predict the weather, what's another pro profession where I could be wrong half the time <laughs> and yet still be employed? So okay. <laughs> I always uh, was, you know, thinking about fantasy in the back of my head as an educator, and uh, something fell in my lap, an opportunity that uh, I'm eternally grateful for, and it started by the great Matthew Berry. Of course, of ESPN fame, uh, he started a site uh, back, uh, God, let's see, 2018, I think in 2005, 2006, called the TownsendMrRoto.com, and a number of great writers have come out of there. Uh, it's kind of like the uh, Bella coaching tree in a way, or <laughs> the Tom Izzo coaching tree. Some of these guys that have branched off and have really made waves in the industry, guys like Andy Barons and myself, Pierre Beckways, uh, one of the head editors at ESPN. Uh, Christopher Harris, who's doing his own thing right now, the Harris Football Podcast. I mean, there's just so many guys that came out of there. Uh, and the reason you know I found it was because Barry had promoted it in a Roto World column at that time. Uh, I, honestly, I'd never read any of Barry's work uh, except for this one instance. Uh, I don't know if it's like divine intervention or something that was you know pulling me, that gravity pulling me toward this column. And at the bottom of it, the footer uh, of his work there on Roto World, he said, "Hey, I'm starting up a Yahoo Groups site." Uh, to try to you know generate additional conversation. Of course, Yahoo Groups no longer exists, uh, but that was kind of social media before social media. It was essentially a large message board, and I started posting stuff on there. Uh, people were responding very positively to some of my fantasy baseball and football takes at that time. Barry reached out to me and said, dude, can you write? I said, can I write? All I did in college was drink and write. <laughs> so uh, I started a, a column called Drinking Beers the Cheap Seats. He says, I can't pay you. I'm going to start this website. I said, no problem. So I did it on the side during my prep hour at school or at home. And the site blew up. And then two years later, uh, out of the kindness of Barry's heart, he offered me up to Yahoo Sports, Brandon Funston, 
uh, at that time, the uh, senior managing editor uh, of Yahoo Fantasy interviewed me, uh, and I got a job, and the rest is history. And that was, you know, over a dozen years ago. Jeez, yeah. So it's been a long time coming. You've got some, uh, got some serious experience in this industry, man. And uh, yeah, yeah I- I'm super pumped to have you again. And uh, I kind of want to tell. This is kind of a funny story right now. So I'm actually, I'm actually in. Um, so okay, so I've been reaching out to you over over Twitter for the last couple of weeks, right? And I'm constantly like, Brad, I want you on for this. I want you on for this. And you know, you've been busy. Uh, you've been on vacation. You're like, hey, try me next week. Try me next week. And that happened a couple of times. And then finally this week, uh, I, I tweeted you and I was like, hey, Brad, come on to the channel, man. I'm not going to stop. Uh, you name a time. You name a day, and I'll I'll make myself available for that. And you were like, Thursday. Uh, let me know the time. And immediately I shot back. I was like, 12:30. Oh my god, let's do this. Like five minutes later, I'm like, oh shit. I'm going to be in Mexico on Thursday. So I'm actually, (laughs) yes, so I'm in Mexico right now. I'm in Cancun. Um, So if you hear music in the background, it's probably because there are about 1,000 21 to 25-year-olds shaking their asses to the music back there. So you can picture that in your head. Um, And I thought it was perfect. Where's the tequila, Nick? That's the most important ingredient here. Hey, Brad, Brad. You're coming that's into. That's my kind of guy. It's Mark season We're in right Mexico, now. You gotta be. love juice. Uh huh. That's my man. So I love. I love tequila and margaritas are. Oh my god, it's, it's the way to my heart. And that that was the whole thing. I was like, oh my god. So I'm gonna be in Mexico. So I call my my friend who's on the trip with me. I'm like, dude, Brad. Like he doesn't follow fantasy football, so he doesn't know like you know the, the OGs in the industry. I'm like, dude, this guy's coming on my channel, and I need to make this happen because I'm not gonna keep pushing you back. I'm like, I finally got the yes. Like I'm not gonna you know try to rearrange this. I'm gonna make this happen. We're calling the hotel. I'm like, you guys have a conference room. You guys have somewhere we could do this, whatever. But it turned out that the Wi-Fi, I have Wi-Fi in my room, and that's why if it does get choppy, it's because I'm in Mexico and it's because of hotel. Um, hotel Wi-Fi, and I was like, dude, I know how much you love tequila, and I'm like, this is perfect. I'm gonna make sure I'm, yeah, I'm double fisting match. my Mars. Yeah, I know. So I was like, you know, maybe this is kind of, this is ironic, and it's kind of funny that it worked out this way. Um, but yeah, man, that's that's kind of the backstory of how this this episode turned out, and, and I'm 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 pretty uh, excited for it. Now I see your background over there. Uh, that doesn't seem to be too too real over there, too tangible. Um, so you're based out of Denver. And I was actually a little uh, yeah. curious about how. Yahoo, um, are, are you work? Do you work remotely, or do you do you guys all come into an office? Because I see you guys do videos together sometimes. Like, how does that work? No, we're all on our, our own little uh, individual islands across the country. So okay. I'm in Denver, Colorado. I mean, I can live and work wherever I choose. Uh, that's the freedom that Yahoo has given us over the years, uh, which is a luxury in this business because normally you have to be. You know, either housed in New York or Los Angeles. So, uh, you know, it's a pleasure that I get to, you know, live in a four season climate, a beautiful area, uh, marijuana galore, excellent <laughs> beer. Uh, the tequila is not bad here either. So, it uh, checks a lot of boxes for me, uh, you know, and for my family as well. So, like Andy Barron's is in Chicago, Scott Pianowski's in Detroit, Liz Loza is actually close to her, uh, one of our main Yahoo Sports offices down in Los Angeles. Uh, she lives out in the Valley. Uh, Dalton Del Don lives in NorCal. So, and then we got Matt Harmon, who we just hired away from uh, NFL.com. And of course, he's in Los Angeles. So, yeah, we're spread out across the country. We get together about once or twice a year, have a little powwow in Los Angeles. Uh, and then we take fantasy football live in Sunnyvale. So, that's in the Bay Area. Okay. So, during the season, I, you know, drive out to Denver International Airport, hop on a plane, uh, and then get up and do the show in the morning. Uh, and then uh, cut some reaction video, hop on a plane, and come back. So uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit unconventional uh, yeah. by the industry standard. But again, that is the pleasure and luxury of working for an open-minded company like Yahoo slash Oath. Plugged. Good stuff right there. Um, so you say you know you just touched on uh, you know it's kind of out of the norm in terms of industry standard. Now uh, this series, I think another reason I'm doing this series is to kind of discover the industry norms and the standards that we have now. And, uh, you know, I, I see some issues with them or I see some, you know, I, I want to talk about the innovation that's kind of coming into the industry and we see a lot of changes happening pretty pretty rapidly, right? You don't see a lot of people um, come up the same way. Like James Coe was someone who I who I just had on and he, he was uh, 
you know, journalism major in college, got his degree, like his grad, uh, went to grad school for journalism and stuff. So he came up the ranks in a pretty typical way. But nowadays, there's so many platforms out there in which you can separate yourself and you don't have to work for a Yahoo or an ESPN or whoever to get yourself out there um, because it's becoming so popular, right? And there's so much room for a lot of people to get into the industry. Uh, and I, I kind of wanted to talk about what you see happening in the industry because I know you're someone who loves video, right? You are a big proponent of the whole video side of fantasy football. And obviously I couldn't agree more doing the whole thing on, uh, on YouTube. So why don't you talk a little bit more about that? Because we have a lot of people trying to break into the industry thinking that you just have to be a blogger. And that's, that's so saturated. You'll never get your blog out there because you know, there's way too many yep. bloggers. There's so many podcasts. I still love podcasts obviously, but that's a hard market to, to break into too. So what's your, uh, What's your what's your fetish with video? Is it because your personality plays well with video, or do you think that's the you know that's the big trend here, and that's where the industry is kind of going with everything? Well, I mean, you got to follow where the uh, the money goes, right? And advertisers are shelling out big bucks uh, uh, on video components, and um, you know the podcast industry is still growing. You're right; it is saturated. There are a ton of fancy pods out there, but there's still room for that as long as you have a unique voice and product. And you know, you look at the success of the fantasy footballers. I mean, they came out of nowhere about five years ago. He had Andy Holloway on recently, and now they've got the biggest podcast in the known universe uh, for fantasy football. So they were able to grow almost at an exponential rate very rapidly. So oh, yes. I feel the video industry is still relatively untapped uh, when it comes to fantasy football. I mean, we do have Fantasy Football Live. We were the first live fantasy football show on the internet, period, when we debuted uh, nearly 13 years ago. Uh, we're still chugging along and still drawing in massive ratings. But, you know, there are a lot of sites out there that, yeah, they're, they're churning out some low-budgeted content, which definitely plays well in the fantasy space because conversation rules. But I still believe, you know, with the trend going from, you know, the core cutters and terrestrial television, going away from that more online and streaming, the production value is starting to come up. And I still feel the uh, appetite is voracious uh, for fantasy football consumers in the video space. So uh, I love it. Uh, I love, uh, you know, interacting with people, whether it's uh, sitting in front of a camera, being behind a mic, uh, you know, on a message board somewhere, you know, below my column and people throwing all kinds of shade at me for some <laughs> of my hot takes that I write up on a routine basis. But, yeah. you know, the biggest quality you need to have in this industry, if you're wanting to climb the ladder or even break in, is versatility. Uh, you got to be sound across the board uh, in, in this business in order to be successful. Uh, you know, you got to be a guy that, you know, it's like a, a multi dimensional running back. You got to be able to catch the ball. You got to be able to pass block. Uh, you got to be able to run tough between the tackles or off edge as well. Have that explosiveness in the open field. You apply that kind of logic to what I do. You know, you got to have a strong voice, you know, again, in front of the camera, behind a mic, typing it up. Uh, you know, really got to hone your craft in all those areas and also have a very strong presence on social media to have longevity in this business. So it's it's absolutely critical. And video is, is one of those primary components that's only going to continue to grow. Yeah, man, I agree with you. It's just having that versatility is so key because consumers, you know, if they like your content, they want to see it everywhere. And they want to see you on Twitter and they want to see you on yep. YouTube. They want to see you on podcasts. I just started an Instagram for fantasy football, which is so outside of the norm, but it's growing quick. Yep. It's growing quickly because Instagram is literally the single biggest social media platform out there. And for some people looking at, at this industry from like a business perspective, it's crazy that they're not on it. And uh, I, I think this is uh, awesome that you came on the show because you're one of you know the, the biggest names in the industry. And uh, I, like I don't see a lot of those guys like for instance like an Evan Silva who has his place amongst you know the Mount Rushmores in the industry right now uh, and he you know he blogs right and I guess he gets on some other videos and stuff but you don't really see a lot of those top guys uh, making themselves too versatile in that sense and I think maybe it's some sort of uh, they're very comfortable where they are but that's what I love about you in that yeah uh, it's not easy to get on video right it's not easy to really like show off your personality and be comfortable doing this and be good at what you're doing and give value all the time and you're very versatile in that sense, and that and that's awesome. Um, and I think that's a big takeaway because again, uh, another point of this whole series is is to inspire and motivate the younger. Uh, a lot of my demographic is is younger, and I kind of say sometimes that I think it's like a, a mix between fantasy footballers and like barstool, right? And I have that younger demo, you know, and, and they're kind of coming up now, um, and they look they look up to people like you, and they look up to people even like me who have a much much smaller platform. But I want to guide them in the right path and, and tell them that there's no one right way. Um, 
to kind of get where you're going, but that's awesome. And I want to touch on the fantasy footballers because you actually came out for one of their live shows, right? Um, in I forget where it was, but you joined them, right? Yeah, it was in Dallas. Uh, we were in Deep Ellum. So it was part of the uh, – there was an event going on called the National Fantasy Football Convention, and the fantasy footballers were out there. I was out there. Matthew Berry was out there. Cousin Sal. Uh, a lot of people in the industry, whether in sports wagering or in fantasy, kind of convened in this area with over 200 current and former NFL players. Um, it's an event that uh, Tony Romo is a part of. He's an investor in it. His uh, cousin, Andy Albereth, runs it. And uh, it was awesome. Um, you know, it's uh, the uh, let's see the second year I've been a part of that. Uh, they're going to be back next year, even bigger and better. And uh, the fantasy footballers, uh, you know, they had already kicked off their live speaking tour, uh, their live podcast taping tour uh, at a previous stop, and I can't remember where that was. Where they they launched it, it might have been in Phoenix, but. Uh, the second one, they invited me uh, graciously to come out and be their hype man, and uh, <laughs> I, I did that, that, and they uh, had me join a mailbag segment as well. So I got to see the you know the the loud, the raucous, the crazies uh, you know that are attached to that uh, that podcast, and man, they got quite a following. I admire the hustle that those guys have done over the years and building their own brand, and they've just really exploded on the scene and are just continuing. Uh, to climb the industry ladder. So kudos to them. And again, it was just an honor to be a part of it. Yeah, man. And and the way they come off and how they built their brand is so it's 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 so awesome to see because they are a real business. You know, they took that side of they're not just yeah. writers or analysts. They look at it from a marketing, social, business side of things. Yep. And and that's why I was so pumped up to have Andy as well. And I'm sure you've been an inspiration for them because they are people who stuck to their personalities in order to build their brand and when I had Andy on, and I've mentioned this to most of the people that I've had on so far, I was like, dude, Andy, you guys are legitimately like the rock stars of our time. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. you know, so five years ago, people are listening to their favorite artists on their way to work, right? And they'll do that for an hour. Now, they're listening to the fantasy footballers. They're listening to another podcast or whatever. And they're actually going like around the country. That's insane. So I wanted to kind of pick your brain about um, innovation in that sense, like, Live engagement. Obviously, fantasy football is such a social sport, and uh, I think that, that the fact that the fact that they they were able to just go around the country and be like, "Guys, we're showing up here, sell out this place. Let's get this thing bumping." Uh, is that like somewhere? And I, I actually want to uh, tell you about something I'm working on a project for later in August, and, and kind of pick your brain on that. But uh, is, is that where you see uh, another piece of innovation? Because I mean, we've had DFS was like the biggest thing like eight to ten years ago, and we're always looking for new. Uh, things coming into the industry that are going to like take it to the next level, and I think what the fantasy footballers are doing in terms of live engagement and these like this nationwide tours, it's it's just fucking crazy. So I want to like pick your brain, like where do you how do you see that fitting into the future of the industry? Yeah, I think you're going to see more and more people do exactly that. In fact, uh, ESPN, uh, you know, followed the playbook of the fantasy footballers, and they did their fantasy uh, podcast. They did live taping in a theater in Los Angeles, sold out. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, and I think you're going to see more companies do the same. So, that, you know, footballers are really trailblazers here because of the popularity of live podcast tapings and other genres, you know, outside of fantasy, outside of sports, you know, like Serial and some of those popular podcasts, they take it on the road, and, mm -hmm. and it's amazing. The turnout that people have uh, and how engaged they really are with this product. So uh, the fact that it's crossed over to fantasy football now, it's proving, you know, that level of intimacy uh, with the listener so people can interact. You know, it's we're getting out from behind our geek machines a little bit, which is good. People want that personable experience. I think you're going to see more and more of that kind of interaction. You know, one of the uh, ideas I've had for years was uh, doing a game day style, like college game day style show, but for fantasy football. And taking it on the road, mm -hmm. uh, being amongst the tailgaters, uh, like in Chicago, among the beer, the brats, the cornhole games, uh, because chances are those people are fantasy players, and uh, they're very passionate about their local sports, uh, equally as passionate about their fantasy teams as well. So, you know, that would be a really cool experience, kind of down and dirty, guerrilla style in terms of filming it, uh, that could, uh, I think, play well in the space. You know, shifting from that and kind of the live engagement to gamification and the product side of things, you're going to see a lot of changes here in the next couple of years uh, due to PASPA dying a swift and, and definitely needed death. Uh, PASPA, of course, the law that prohibited 
uh, sports gambling outside of the state of Nevada. Uh, that no longer is in play. Uh, it's going to go state by state, much like legal marijuana. We're already seeing that right now, as you can bet legally in Delaware, New Jersey, of course, which is at the forefront of that case, uh, tied to Chris Christie. Uh, Pennsylvania is going to be up and running soon, along with Rhode Island. I think Illinois, Michigan will follow suit. I would say within the next two years, probably 20 to 25 states will have some form of legalized sports gambling. So the crossover from that side of the business to fantasy on the Venn diagram is huge. Yeah. You know, that section in the middle is probably 75%. So what you're going to see are more simplified games. They're going to come to the forefront. Don't be surprised like player propositions, you know, over or under Patrick Mahomes passing touchdowns against the Denver Broncos one and a half. Well, not only does that play to the gambling side of things, it totally plays to the fantasy side of things too, right? Uh, because that's essentially it. So that is the gateway, I think, for entry for a lot of these uh, sports gambling sites to try to lure in new players is by tapping in the fantasy audience and people who are their own self-proclaimed aficionados, experts, who believe, oh, yeah, you know, Patrick Mahomes, he's got to throw three touchdowns in that game. I guarantee it, given the secondary Denver and how they're, you know, battered and bruised, just as an, uh, an example, yeah. a hypothetical. So you're going to see that kind of gamification increase. You're going to see more and more money come in as a result of that. And it's, it's going to be a boon for the industry. And you're already starting to see it as... The FSCA did some research uh, from Ipsos here in the last uh, FCA conference that happened in June, and they released it and said that uh, fantasy companies are going to increase three to five x over the next three to five years because of PASPA dying. So it's it's a stunning uh, second gold rush that we are starting to experience in the fantasy industry. Hell yeah, that's what I like to hear. That's good for business. A um, lot of lot of good info over there, man. A um, lot of good points you touched on. I actually want to know just really quickly how many how many uh, heads did the footballers have like at their show that you were at in the crowd? Yeah, so max capacity of the venues that they've been uh, predominantly playing to was around 500. So you know your smaller wow. concert venues. Okay. Uh, at the one in Dallas, uh, they were in like three to 350 people. But I know in like Phoenix, uh, New York, they recently were there, Philadelphia. I think they sold out yeah. all of those venues. Wow. So, you know, the draw was really strong in some of those other cities uh, compared to what we saw in Big D. Yeah, that's crazy. I, yeah, I saw um, a stat uh, the other day, I think, that I saw they had like 30 million podcast downloads last year. And that was, I, I knew they were big and I knew they were number one, but I didn't realize the number was that big. But that's a staggering size for a crowd, man. That is, uh, that's, I mean, that's good to hear because like you said, the rest of the brands and companies and, and solopreneurs or whatever are going to start doing more and more of, of that stuff. And then you uh, you touch on the sports gambling, which was something I was going to you know eventually segue into because I know you're a, you're yep. a gambler, right? And yep. you, you touched a lot uh, mostly on it. And I guess your po your outlook for it is positive as well as the research that that has been done. And that was just something that I was wrestling with in my mind. I wasn't sure. How, I mean, obviously, it would bring overall, it had to bring more volume into just the general interest to sports. Uh, but I didn't know if that was going to be a necessarily a good thing for fantasy or not. Like, obviously, it's going to bring more money in. But does that, does that take away some of the money that people are using for fantasy and go towards gambling? And I know this is probably a few years away from it really being like a huge, uh, you know, being being the mainstream where there's like a perfect app with perfect aesthetics. That you can just get on, do a bet really quickly. And we'll probably have a little, a little while uh, before that. Goes away, and I'm uh, I'm actually I reside in New Jersey, so yeah, I'm I'm, I'm definitely uh, <laughs> looking closely at what's going on here. But yeah, so you think it's it's definitely all good, all gravy for fantasy sports in terms of gambling being legalized? Yeah, I, I mean, in kind of the the larger perspective, the ten thousand foot view, yeah, I think it's a very positive development because there is going to be that increased gamification, which is going to increase the amount of money and revenue that comes, and which will then trickle down to hey, we need to hire more people to create content around some of these existing games. So mm -hmm. in terms of long-term sustainability, uh, I think it's uh, definitely a, a you know a couple of thumbs up in that category. The one area, the one sector I think you got to be a little bit concerned about is daily fantasy because yes, yes. daily fantasy more or less was legalized sports gambling, though it was uh, classified as a skill game. So it was able to circumvent the law. Now that that gray area uh, no longer really exists in, you know, let's say New Jersey, your home state, for example, you've seen companies like DraftKings and FanDuel morph into sports books. 
And uh, they know they have to do that in order to stay afloat, to pay off all the uh, invest investors that they've you know raised capital with over the years. Uh, that is uh, the quote unquote money shot, mm-hmm. if you will, for both of those uh, companies. And uh, you're going to only just con- continue to see them hammer that home and continue to see them grow uh, their sports book products. So uh, I think DFS has plateaued as a result. I think it's a complicated game. I think it's tough to bring in new users because of the tarnished reputation uh, that came out of you know the flood of advertising a few years ago, the supposed insider trading that may or may not have happened um, you know between those companies. So because it's tainted in a way, because it's complex and complicated to play for the layman or the new user, uh, I think those games are you know they're not gonna die. I just don't see any growth there. I don't see any potential. That's why they're going to see more simplified gamification from some of these uh, DFS sites and companies and some of the season-long products as well to tap into this new marketplace. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I was thinking my, my initial thought was like this is definitely going to affect the DFS side of things because people don't play – you don't play DFS for the same reason you play redraft leagues, right? Like redraft leagues is all about engagement. You know, I, I don't even think I play redraft leagues had it not been – for me being in a league with my friends from high school, my friends from college, and like my subscriber league and things like that. It's all about being social and bringing that stuff in. So I can definitely see uh, a portion of the revenue from DFS probably go over to gambling because it's so much easier, right? Like you could, you could tell your girlfriend, yeah. like put, uh, hit the over on, on Patrick Mahomes' touchdown and she's good for it, but she's not going to sit there and fill out a 10-person a a lineup, you know what I mean? So yeah, that's that's definitely a good point, a good way to look at it. And uh, uh, going back to the whole live engagement thing, because, you know, circling back to um, how I don't think it will affect redraft whatsoever. Um, one, if you guys end up doing that show, I want to I want to guess by if we're doing a if we're doing a tailgate for fantasy football, man. I want on one of those shows. Bad. Number two. Definitely. Yeah. Hell yeah. Let's let's do it, man. That's a great idea. I never even thought about that. But I think uh, I, I think that has so much potential. That's a that's a fantastic idea. And I wanted to kind of segue into what I have going this this uh, at the end of August. So I do subscriber leagues with with the people, you know, that with my audience normally like regular redraft leagues. But I decided, you know, because I was I, I did start looking at this from uh, more of a business marketing perspective once this summer hit because I saw I, I probably had maybe like three or four hundred subscribers last summer and then all of a sudden by the end of the season it was up to five thousand and now it's growing. I'm almost at eight thousand. I'll probably be at ten K by the end of the summer and I'm like, dude, I gotta look at this from you know, once you build an audience you can you could turn that into revenue when you want to. And I don't look at it from like a revenue standpoint, really. But I started looking at it that way. And I'm like, I need to think of, I, I do an online magazine, like sem- similar to the footballers, um, UDK. I do something like that. And I sell it for, you know, like 30 bucks or whatever, which is fine. But you need to sell so many of those in order for that to be a big part of your income. So I'm like, I need to think of something that people will pay a high price for, right? People that are willing to pay uh, a high ticket product on. And I'm like, no one... People will do that for live engagement, like one-on-one engagement with you, right? These are an audience that I built that I became loyal with. So I was like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold a a redraft league, a live redraft league. I'm going to rent out an Airbnb in New York City. So we have that booked already. And I brought on, or I'm bringing in nine of my subscribers from all over the country. We have people from San Francisco, from Virginia. I think there's a guy from Canada coming, to be honest with you. Uh, I have to, awesome. I, I have to check that. Right. And I'm like, I'm like, this is, this is so crazy, but I got nine of my subscribers. They're flying out at the end of August. It's like the last weekend in August. Um, and we're going to be hanging out from Friday to Sunday. So we got this Friday. We're going to have the live draft Saturday. We're going to go out in New York city. I mean, this is like, it doesn't get more football than that and more engaged than that. And like social, you know what I mean? And these are the type of kind of want to like, you know, first of all, see your reaction and, and kind of gauge what you thought about that. But like, these are the type of things where, um, you know, the industry can be going. And I just see like the live engagement part is such a, a big piece of, uh, of that's that, that pie that hasn't been eaten yet, you know? Yeah. People just want accessibility. I mean, that's pretty much the bottom line. And, you know, in a season long format with your audience, it, it is that social experiment. It's the camaraderie that you have created uh, through this channel. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, they want to, again, get out from behind their machines and actually interact with another human being in the flesh. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of an innate uh, desire that we all have. And, you know, fantasy is a great conduit uh, to connect the two together. So, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, I think uh, what, you, you know, you can do on your channel specifically, concierge services, essentially. You know, it's like somebody that's there on demand on Sunday morning. Hey, I got a lineup question. 
I know, uh, you know, with the utmost uh, dependability that you're going to be there on Sunday morning to answer my, my question. And, you know, again, people just want that personal touch. It's really important to them um, in, in terms of this business as a whole. So I think you're on the right track. I think that's a genius idea, renting out an Airbnb for your users because uh, it's, uh, you know, very cool and unique to interact with them in that kind of form. Yeah, I mean, the logistics have kind of been a nightmare because I just thought of the idea. I plugged it into my <laughs> channel. Before I knew it, I had, you know, dozens and dozens of emails like asking about it. Um, but we've, we've, we've locked down the itinerary and everything is good to go. Um, I, I, I don't expect that you will be in New York City the weekend of August 24th to the 26th by any chance. Uh, it's too bad because I'm actually going to be out there August 21st and 22nd. Uh, oh. But I will be home. Damn. Um, you know. During that time, so sorry, we'll not be there. Uh, okay, well, yeah, I would have, uh, I would have made you come by and say, say hello to the gang and meet you in person would have been awesome. But yeah, I mean, that's that's a that's a cool idea. Um, what you're saying, like concierge. So I live stream pretty much every Sunday morning um, before kickoff, which is kind of upsetting because I used to I used to actually watch you guys for that like the that hour two hours prior to kickoff happening. But you know, got got to do my own thing. What's good for the brand? Um, and I did yeah, start. Cool. I did start. Uh, I opened up like a, a consulting kind of you know, thing with, you know, on my, on my website. And I thought like, that's another thing that we could pull from a different industry that we see uh, super successful with basically every other industry, but people don't do it in fantasy football. And I have um, CD Carter, Danny Carter coming on to the channel to discuss, you know, further into this, uh, this, this series, because he, you know, is the founder of draft day consultant. So I'm excited to talk to him and see like his perspective of how he brought, um, how, how, why he thought of that and like how he put that into play and stuff. So that's, that was, uh, definitely a, a good thought on your part. And I'm kind of excited to see where it goes because I, I mean, I, that's at the core of it. I mean, you do this stuff, like you write and, and you do your fantasy analysis to help people out. Right. I mean, you're passionate about it in the end it, it's for yep. helping people out. And I do want to give people, um, actionable advice on, on these interviews, man. And, um, and people have the guests that I've had on have been so, you know, they, these usually get like super deep and they go more into like life, uh, life advice, not just like fantasy and stuff, but you mentioned versatility and I know that you dabble with not only fantasy football, fantasy baseball and these other sports and stuff. Um, do you think that's necessarily, um, crucial for fantasy analysts to be able to do? Cause I don't really do anything besides I like, I like basketball and I like baseball and stuff, but it's almost like yeah. learning another language. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I can't speak Italian. Um, so I, I'm not that good at fantasy basketball, but when I look at fantasy football numbers, it's like the, they just run in my head and I'm like, okay, this, 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 I see these patterns and whatever. Um, so is that more just like a personal thing for you? You just love the other sports and that's why you got into it. Or do you do that intentionally? For the well, brand. I, I, I've always said this. This is a key piece of advice for anybody that wants to break in the industry. And again, to survive in the business, you got to have a second sport. You really do. Yeah, football is king, but football is six months, seven months, eight months or so out of the year. You want something to fill the gap. And for me, I'm a college basketball junkie. And uh, I grew up, uh, That actually my first love has always been college basketball. I still love the tournament. I think it is the greatest uh, you know, sporting event uh, on the calendar every single year. It's far better than the Super Bowl, in my opinion, especially for sports wagering. It's amazing from start to finish. If you've never been to Vegas during the opening rounds mm -hmm. of the NCAA tournament, put it on your bucket list. Oh, you man. will not forget it. Right and you'll want to go right back now. every single year. So for me, you know, it, it's a natural transition. Even though the college basketball season starts in November, uh, and I'm not really paying that much uh, attention to it. I'm, I'm watching games here or there. But, you know, once the NFL regular season ends, you know, right after New Year's Day, I am crunching film. I'm going back and watching games from November, December, um, you know, in preparation uh, for, you know, scouting the rest of the season. Uh, and then I'm a bracketologist at Yahoo, and then I cover the NCAA tournament. So, you know, I transitioned very quickly from football to basketball, and I'm basically a, a college basketball, quote-unquote, expert for two and a half months. And that fills the gap until the NFL draft. And then the calendar starts right back up again. So, it, you know, in terms of how uh, the calendar is laid out throughout the course of the year, it, it, it's seamless in my transition. But there are a lot of people like Andy Barron, Scott Pinowski, Dalton Del Don, you know, people that work with me at Yahoo Sports. They also cover fantasy baseball. And I did that for a number of years. I got really tired of and bored with it and wanted to concentrate more on the basketball side of things. So it is important to have a second sport unless you are aiming to work at like the NFL Network or NFL.com where they want to talk football 24-7, 365 days a year. Other sites like ESPN and Yahoo and CBS, 
uh, even some of the upcoming sites uh, that are out there, there's DraftKings, FanDuel, whatever, they want you to be versatile and uh, somebody that can speak the language in more than just football. Like I said, I don't really analyze the other sports. I just I just watch them, and it's crazy because you know I have those like three, four months off between when the Super Bowl, really when the fantasy playoffs end, which is like week sixteen for the most part, and then all the way up until the NFL draft. And I'm like, Ugh, I want to I want to put out content. I want to put out content because for the most part, my channel, the engagement, and and the subs come in, and all you know, all that happens really within like a you know June, July, August, September, like those months. And it's so hard to keep grinding and, and keep putting that work in, in in the off months when you're not seeing a tangible return on investment. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I guess is kind of a random yeah. question, I guess, that kind of popped in my head. But when you were like starting, I guess you, you had a unique way that you broke in with just, you know, being engaging on those Yahoo posts and those Yahoo groups or whatever. For people maybe, I don't know, like like burnt out or for people, you know, trying to get in and, and maybe things are like slowing down or they're hitting like a mental block. Do you, do you I mean, at, at this point of your career, you're so successful that it's like you don't really have anything to prove. Um, but do you have any advice like maybe early on when you started where they're like, what, what were some of the road bumps you hit? Well, I mean, obviously, on the television side, it's uh, trying to convince the old hat that fantasy football has a place on the on the screen, uh, and that's still a battle that exists today. Um, you know, it, it blows my mind that when you turn on a Sunday morning show like on Fox or on CBS before NFL kickoff, it's a bunch of old players that talk fucking cliches oh uh, or old coaches that do the same thing, and there's zero fantasy presence on those programs. You've had a little bit of crossover in ESPN, uh, but you know ESPN Fantasy Football now has been a tremendous success. It, it's highly rated. Um, you know the the number of eyes that it draws astounds me. Much like our show on YahooSports.com, so there's clearly an appetite there. But a lot of these guys that are in high level positions as producers or executive producers or decision makers at some of the large companies, they still don't get it. Dude. Even though you know, you've know you got uh, 60 million players throughout Canada and the United States that play actively in fantasy football, and you, it, you know, and it feeds the, like the average fantasy player age is right around 33, 34 years old. Females are getting more involved. So it covers a, a wide swath of uh, advertising demographics. And yet uh, these guys are in these high-level positions in many cases are just so damn stubborn. Yep that they refuse to accept it and buy into it. Like, I mean, I think there should be a fantasy analyst uh, on call, similar like you have uh, a Mike Pereira, uh, you know, when they go to him in terms of, all right, Mike, uh, what are you seeing on this controversial call, yeah. this flag here, you know, or, or both feet in, is it a catch, whatever it may be. When there is a, a huge moment, like maybe there's a breakout performance in the first half of a game, from an unknown source, you toss to a fantasy guy who gives you two minutes of analysis and is breaking it down instantly on camera. Uh, I pitched that idea to a couple of uh, major companies. Um, it got nowhere. In fact, I got laughed at when I presented it. And it just, it, to me, people need to evolve and people need to follow the money. Yeah, dude. And it seems only sensible to do stuff like this. So, those are some of the roadblocks, some of the obstacles that are still ever present. You know, one piece of advice I always give people, constantly think creatively. Come up with new ways to, uh, you know, spin things, uh, to make you look like you're, you're bringing something unique to the table. And always stay hungry. Uh, I'm somebody that res respects people that hustle their tails off, much like the fantasy footballers. I believe in that. Uh, I am constantly hungry. I'm constantly grinding. I'm always trying to find new inventive ways to uh, preach fantasy football, to express it, whether in social media, whether through video, whether through audio, trying to break down barriers and see what sticks to the wall and what slips off of it. So, I mean, that, that's the best approach. And eventually, you know, I'm 40 years old. Guys from my generation – and really, the first generation, you know, Matthew Barry, Andy Barons, uh, Brandon Funts, and those guys in their mid to late forties, as uh, people in you know high level positions start climbing a ladder, who started as fantasy players and now are in those positions, you know, as high level television producers. Eventually, they're going to come around the idea of, oh, we get fantasy now. We're going to you know open up the box and we're going to do all kinds of different things. 
to try to play into that audience because they know how engaging it is. Yeah, I mean, that, dude, that's why I'm such a fan of yours because you are in that um, that group of people who have been so successful, but you still manage to come up with creative ways to adapt to the industry and, and, and you know, like, and follow the trends. And like you said, follow the money and you do that so well. And a lot of people don't because they've hit this level of success and they're just like, I'm going to do what got me here. But for the most part, a lot of things just in life, man, a lot of the things that, that you see other people, if they're in a position that you want to be in, what they did to get there will not be the thing that takes you there. So you have to always be thinking creatively and adaptively in order to get there. Um, yeah, and I think totally. I mean, look at a guy like Matt Harmon. You know, Matt Harmon is yep. 27 years old, and he has gone from being a nobody to NFL.com and really, you know, establishing his brand there with the reception perception and everything he's done with fantasy footballers and their, you know, ultimate draft kit and all that. And now he is running our social uh, platform for Yahoo Fantasy crazy, and is crazy. also talent. And, you know, he's he's got a, a really good gig. He's got a full-time job in this business at 27. Yep. So, I mean, there and he created on his own because he, he played to a niche with reception perception, and he created something on his own that nobody had ever done before, breaking things down graphically through film, backing up with these very unique stats, uh, tapping into the uh, success rates. Warren Sharp is another wow. guy in this business who so has uh, really started to make a name for himself the last couple of years because he's innovating. Yep. And coming up with some different ways to present information. You know, it may be dry to some people, but for, you know, stat nerds like myself are always looking for different ways to craft and tailor uh, an argument for a particular player. Having these new measurements uh, is invaluable to me uh, and explaining it and preaching it to the masses. So, you know, those are two guys that are just prime examples that even just the last couple of years have, have come out of the woodwork, out of the shadows. And it really climbed the ladder very, very quickly. So that's what you have to think about if you're wanting to break in this industry and make a name for yourself. Hundred percent. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more in that sense because uh, that's why, like, even the the young kids who are coming up, that like I'm in the marketing field. When I'm not doing fantasy football stuff, like that's what I do uh, professionally. You know, I do social media marketing um, for like e-commerce businesses and other things like that. But like. I, I'm constantly looking at things from a marketing and business perspective, and I want people that are coming up to look at it that way because it's not just like the content you put out is great, but you have to make sure that you deliver it in a way that people haven't seen before so they get engaged or through a platform that's, you know, so you can be first to market. And I think like in a sense, I feel like I'm lucky that I got onto YouTube and I was able to grow my audience here because it's yeah. very, very uh, un unsaturated right now. And people like... There's there really are only still a handful of channels that are that are growing quickly right now, and it, dude, it's like getting in on Google when when Google first became a thing because it's literally just search words and people type in top sleepers or whatever, and I'm one of the top five videos on there, and of course I'm going to get a bunch of views and a bunch of subs from that. So people always need to be thinking creatively. What's the next platform? Where can I put my message out that people aren't seeing a million other messages? And it's a great point with like Matt Harmon. And even uh, Josh ADHD, who came on my channel, he's the guy who builds the tools and he puts those charts of the ADPs up on his Twitter, which is so different than what you see from other people. And you always need to be looking like, you know, maybe it is a specific skill set that gets you there. Maybe it is uh, you being first to market in a platform. But at the end of the day, like, I do feel lucky in a sense that I got there early, but I understand how much work it takes to be successful. So I don't think anyone who is successful is actually lucky. Like, there is a little bit of luck, but hard work is 99.9% is .9 of it. Um, and I want, I really want to hammer that home to the, to the people in the audience that are trying, this is really, I mean, this is, this is life advice for anything. It's like no one that you know that is successful didn't work incredibly hard at what they're doing. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I just want them to take, uh, that away. And I, I know you talked about so many things and I feel like I had a million kind of counter questions to, um, to what you're saying, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. And I forgot to, I didn't bring a pen to Mexico. Unfortunately, I have my notebook with... <laughs> With, with, with no <laughs> notes here. Margaritas, and that's all that matters right now. Dude, I'm already done. I need to go for a refill, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get a refill, my man. I am about to hit the bar downstairs. I'm about to hit the pool. Um, and I usually end these series is with, um, you know, actionable advice to up-and-comers. But, I mean, you've already hit on, like, 8, 10, if not 12 of them. Um, so we probably don't even need to get in there. But if you have any more uh, notes or anything you would like to say to the younger demographic, because that is a lot of my audience – then feel free to kind of plug it here or let them know like what you're working on uh, on Yahoo, the shows that you got coming out and, and where they can find you and anything, you know, the stage is yours. Just, just hit them with that knowledge right now. 
Yeah, you can find me on Twitter with any of these questions. If you want to, you know, extend the conversation beyond just this video, hit me up at Yahoo Noise. Uh, I'm very interactive on there. I, I try to answer as many questions as I, you know, humanly possibly can uh, over the course of a day. Uh, I have a television show entering season three called The Fantasy Football Hour, which I created. Uh, I'm an executive producer on. I write it. I co-star on it with Nate Lundy and Laura Gardner. Uh, we're hopefully going to air between 85 million and 90 million households this year, coast to coast, on regional sports networks. So check your most, uh, local listings as uh, we relaunch August 23rd. Uh, again, you know, coast to coast. Um, I've got a podcast out called The Fantasy Record. I do with my esteemed colleague, Brandon Funston. Uh, it's available on iTunes uh, and also in the Google Play Store, Google Podcasts as well. And the Yahoo Fantasy Podcast, which we just reintroduced. Uh, our first episode came out last week. Liz Loza at the controls uh, running the show uh, for that particular program. And we got everybody in the pool, Matt Harmon, Andy Barons, Andy Dalton, or Andy Dalton, not Andy Dalton, Dalton Del Don. Uh, <laughs> and Scott, I see football just creeps into the mind at all times. I Scott Bynowski as well. So uh, those are the things I got going on in Fantasy Football Live back for season 13, week one on yahoosports.com. So yes, I'm a busy man. Hell yeah. You see how hard this guy is working over here, man. You don't get to the position that he's in without putting the work in, guys. So take that away from this episode. Uh, Brad, I can't thank you enough for coming on, man. This, this episode absolutely did not disappoint. I'm sure my audience will love every bit of this. I can't wait to put this on the channel. And everything he just discussed, all those shows and all of the, uh, the accounts and stuff you guys can go follow will be linked in the description below. Uh, as you guys know, it is officially March season, so your man's got to go hit the bar. Because uh, I am in Cancun, yes. um, but this is a lesson to be learned right here. I'm in Cancun, and, I, and I'm, on, I'm on video with my man's Brad over here. Um, last question, actually. What what are you doing in New York? Do you are you have a, a completely booked schedule? Uh, I, I missed that part. Oh, I, I was asking. In you, New York? You're, you're going to be in New York, you said, for a couple of days. Do you have, like, a, do you, are one of your happy hours maybe not booked? Can I buy you some tequila? Well, I, yeah, I'm cut a bunch of videos. I'm cut a bunch of videos on our campus uh, in Manhattan, oh, and then uh, the primary reason I'm going out there actually is for an event uh, through Adam Wainwright's organization. Okay. Uh, it's a it's a charity event, and we're doing something actually not with the St. Louis Cardinals, who Wainwright plays for, but the New York Mets. Uh, so the Mets are uh, having a draft uh, on like the 22nd at uh, City Field. So uh, I'm going over there to basically be a play-by-play -play guy for their draft, talk smack to David Wright and a lot of the players there, Jacob DeGrom as well. Be like, dude, DeGrom, why'd you cut your hair? <laughs> um, so, you know, that's the primary motivation, and we're going to capture a lot of that on video. But, yeah, man, unfortunately, I'm booked. Uh, I like to get in, get out of New York City as quick as humanly possible. Okay. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, kind of the gist of this trip. It's down and dirty, uh, lightweight. I'm only packing a backpack, uh, probably going to, you know, hit the late night bar scene maybe on the 21st okay. uh but uh you know again my primary motivation there is to cover this new york mets event all right i, I figured you were booked and that's uh, that's unfortunate because you know my i, I would have got my ass on the train and met you somewhere and, and bought you probably an, abs an absurd amount of tequila but uh you know next time you're <laughs> in new york i would love to link up and and uh kind of meet face to face but you got a lot of good stuff going on it sounds like and uh we will wrap up the episode there guys if you enjoyed this interview which i can't imagine you did not please leave the thumbs up down below subscribe to the channel if you're new um and i'm not sure who's going to be on the next episode but uh, i'm sure it's going to be a good one so stay tuned for that and we'll see y'all later peace